Well, as we continue to track what's going on with the gun ban and litigation against the law here in Illinois, we've got the latest filing from the states in response to Attorney Thomas Mag's Fifth Amendment challenge. And that was filed late on Friday. Uh, of course, this is part of the consolidated cases in the Southern District of Illinois with the Judge Stephen McGlynn uh, moving forward with the merits of this case. And you had uh, Thomas Mag with uh, three different major challenges against the law. Of course, the Second Amendment challenge. Then you had a 14th Amendment challenge saying that the law was unconstitutionally vague. Now you have this Fifth Amendment challenge uh, against the law from saying that people uh, are possibly being forced to violate their Fifth Amendment rights. So let's go ahead and get into that now here with Bishop on Air. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and follow along as we uh, continue on this morning. Uh, of course, uh, some, some freezing rain uh, might be causing some problems for the live stream, but the good thing is we record uh, these segments here locally so that we can uh, get these to you uh, unencumbered uh, so you can watch these later on throughout the day. So I appreciate uh, everybody who's stuck through this morning thus far, but let's get into this with the uh, uh, the, the state responding to uh, the Fifth Amendment challenge in the Southern District of Illinois. So uh, pulling up that case here and uh, you've got, of course, you know, the, the arguments being made, uh, just looking at the table of contents here, uh, they say that uh, the, the law does not violate the privilege against self-incrimination. The state says the endorsement affidavit is not directed at the criminality uh, and does not compel a confession of criminal activity. They say the endorsement affidavit does not compel or coerce any testimony and the possibility uh, plaintiffs will be prosecuted based on their endorsement affidavit is not real and substantial. So therefore, they say plaintiffs should not be granted leave to add a new due process claim. So let's go ahead and go through some of this because I do think it's uh, kind of fascinating says, uh, you know, goes through and, and talks about uh, the exemptions and the exceptions and the uh, lawsuit that's filed. The prohibition does not apply to a person's possession of an assault weapon owned before the law became effective January 10th. If the person has provided certain information in an endorsement affidavit prior to January 1st, here we are. The January 1st deadlines come and gone and that uh, registration rate is pretty low. Uh, so they go on and talk about how the plaintiffs have moved for summary judgment, summary judgment is on the merits uh, and they're looking at that fifth amendment claim here so let's go through some of the arguments here from the uh, the state. They say the law does not violate the privilege against self-incrimination for three reasons. First, the endorsement affidavit is a voluntary benefit that exempts owners of certain assault weapons from otherwise applicable criminal penalties. It is not directed at the criminally suspect, and the act of submitting an affidavit does not constitute a confession of criminality. Second, the state goes on to say no one is compelled to submit an affidavit. The government has no authority to impose any criminal or economic penalty on residents who are eligible to submit an affidavit, but for whatever reason, decline to do so. That's interesting. Let me read that again. No one is compelled to submit an affidavit. The government has no authority to impose any criminal or economic penalty on residents who are eligible to submit an affidavit, but for whatever reason, decline to do so. They go on to say, uh, third, the possibility plaintiffs will be prosecuted based on the information contained within their affidavit is not real and substantial. The fanciful chain of evidence uh, of events they have dreamed up has no serious chance of coming to fruition. Uh, they then go on to talk about registration and disclosure provisions are common in federal and state statutes. These types of provisions only implicate the Fifth Amendment if they are directed at the crimin criminally suspect or compel confession of criminal activity. The endorsement affidavit uh, process in the Protect Illinois Communities Act does neither of these things and as a result does not violate the Fifth Amendment. Three leading cases, all decided on the same day, identify the narrow circumstances in which a disclosure or registration provision may infringe the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. None of those circumstances is applicable here. Then it goes through uh, various court precedents. Uh, it says failure to register and pay was uh, punishable by criminal penalties in one court at the same time, however, uh, and its ancillary activities were widely prohibited under both federal and state law. It goes on to give more court precedents. 
precedent and so on, uh, and even more court precedent, uh, and also the, the Haney's versus United States, which uh, MAG is using as court precedent, said that the Supreme Court held the privilege against self-incrimination was violated by a provision of the National Firearms Act. A person in possession of certain unlawful acquired firearms was required to furnish to the Secretary of the Treasury with his name, address, and place where the firearms usually kept, and the place of business or employment, along with his date of birth, social security number, and whether he has ever been convicted of a felony, plus a full description of the firearm. Failure to comply was punishable by fines and imprisonment, and the registration requirement did not apply, however, to anyone who had complied with the National Firearms Act's mandate concerning the transfer manual manufacture or importation of firearms in question. The registration requirement was, in other words, directed principally at those persons who have obtained possession of a firearm without complying with the act's other requirements and who therefore are immediately threatened by criminal prosecution. As the Seventh Circuit has explained, the objectionable fake feature of the, uh, stat the, the, the statutes found to violate the privilege against self-incrimination in the Haney's case and others was the act of registration itself constituted an ipso facto confession of criminality. The registration requirement declared unconstitutional in the Marchetti case required people to confess and intention of uh, commencing a gambling activities in violation of federal law. The registration requirement declared unconstitutional in Grasso required people to confess detailed information on gambling activities conducted in violation of federal and state law. And the registration requirement uh, declared unconstitutional in Haney's required people to confess possession of firearms that had not been transferred to them in accordance with federal law. Uh, so it goes on to, to make those points. By contrast, they say the privilege against self-incrimination is not violated when the mere act of registration does not automatically subject a person to criminal penalties. A person who must register under these circumstances does not confront the in criminating straitjacket of alternatives created in Marchetti, Grasso, and Haney's because the registration requirement is not principally directed at persons who have failed to comply with other statutory requirements and thus inherently suspect of criminal activities. So essentially, I mean, they're saying that, uh, from my understanding, and again, I'm not an attorney, but from my understanding, uh, the state's essentially saying that just because you don't register, you can't be charged. And even Illinois State Police have said why they're keeping the January 1st registration deadline open, uh, even here now at uh, January 22nd, uh, still haven't seen any updated numbers, by the way. We were told by Illinois State Police we'd see updated registration numbers, but those numbers have not been updated. Uh, but uh, they say that there's nothing in the law that provides criminal penalties for those that do not comply with the registry. Uh, just merely, as the state has said, uh, it gives them the uh, uh, the option of being able to keep those firearms uh, if they're grandfathered in. But you get into a whole host of other issues uh, in the question of, you know, if you do file after the January 1st deadline, are you, uh, you know, outing yourself as having banned firearms and registering them after the deadline? Uh, so, so interesting to see that. Uh, but let's go a little bit further down into this, uh, this, this, this docket uh, entry on the, uh, the state's response to the Thomas Mag Fifth Amendment challenge. It says, plaintiff's Fifth Amendment challenge to PICA's endorsement affidavit process fails for another independent reason. The privilege against self-incrimination is violated only when a person is compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Uh, goes on to say, thus, uh, there must be some element of compulsion before courts will find a Fifth Amendment violation. Uh, absent some officially coerced self-accusation, the Fifth Amendment privilege is not violated by even the most damning admissions. Uh, goes on to say this is because the Fifth Amendment privilege is intended to relieve claimants of necessity of making a choice between incriminating themselves and risking serious punishments for refusing to do so. Uh, so again, uh, no punishments, they're saying, uh, when it comes to not uh, filing that endorsement affidavit. Uh, and they say that uh, doing so is is voluntary uh, is voluntary uh, to dis to determine whether a person has been compelled to incriminate himself courts look to the penalty the government is able to extract 
if the person refuses to do so. Testimony may be coerced if the government can impose criminal penalties on a person who remains silent in the face of questioning. Uh, goes on to say, in addition, the government may coerce testimony if it threatens to revoke a professional license. Uh, and one thing that Illinois State Police has said is that uh, merely not filing an endorsement affidavit that you own a banned firearm cannot be used to uh, take away somebody's FOID card, for instance. Here in the state of Illinois, the firearm owner identification card. Uh, it goes on to say that the government here, by contrast, has no recourse against a person who's eligible to submit an endorsement affidavit but declines to do so. The decision whether to submit an affidavit is entirely voluntary. Choosing to refrain on its own does not expose anyone to penalties at all. True, people may face penalties if they both decline to submit affidavits and then also possess assault weapons in Illinois, but those penalties arise because of the subsequent act of possession, not the failure to submit an affidavit. David. People who do not wish to submit an affidavit have other options available to avoid criminal possession. Their exempt assault weapons in Illinois. They can sell them to an eligible purchaser, retain ownership, but move it out of state, give the firearm to law enforcement, or permanently disable or destroy it. Uh, at most, then, people who decline to submit an endorsement affidavit forego the opportunity to continue lawfully possessing exempt assault weapons. To plaintiffs, the alternatives, like disposing of their weapons or moving them out of states may be undesirable and therefore they may feel some pressure to submit the affidavit, but the Supreme Court has held that it has never suggested uh, that all government's pressures constitute compulsion for Fifth Amendment purposes, and they cite another case. Put another way, pressure to speak in the hope of obtaining a government benefit does not make the speech compelled in violation of the privilege against self-incrimination. Uh, because the endorsement affidavit does not compel any testimony, plaintiff's Fifth Amendment challenge must fail. Uh, and then they go on to uh, uh, recap some other arguments, and ultimately they um, say that uh, the plaintiffs here uh, should not have their their, uh, final judgment granted. So uh, that's the latest in the uh, litigation. Of course, February 2nd in the Southern District of Illinois, they're going to have another conference to uh, further delve into the merits of this and how they're going to proceed forward with witnesses and expert testimony. So clearly there's going to be some ongoing things uh, we will track here on this particular case in the Southern District of Illinois. It is Bishop on Air. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. If you like what you see and you want to support the program, tell your friends about it and uh, all also, be sure to check out some of the uh, merchandise below on the YouTube channel or go to bishoponair.com. Live each and every weekday morning here with Bishop on Air. Uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, and if you hit that notification bell, you'll know that when we post new videos or when we uh, go live. So uh, hopefully you'll stay up to date with us here with Bishop on Air. Stay tuned.